Well, thanks very much, Bill. It's a huge privilege to be here tonight honoring Heinz Pagels. You know, one of the great things about the academic life is you get to be taught things by brilliant people even if you don't meet them in person. Or you read what they do and it's like they're right there in the room with you. And uh, if you're really lucky, you then get to go on and teach other people things who you'll never meet. And um, so when I was a PhD student, my classmates and I, we desperately needed to know about non-abelian gauge theories and there was Heinz Pagels teaching it to us and we're all very grateful because you know, somehow our professors were too busy to do that. So, but that's not what I want to talk to you about tonight. And I can't really recommend that you read that particular article because it's a little bit technical, but I do really recommend that you read the books by Heinz Pagels. If I had to choose one, I think I'd choose one called The Dreams of Reason. And you know, it's such a good book that you might want to consider just quietly leaving the auditorium right now and go buying a copy and <laughs> spending the evening with Heinz instead of me, okay? Could be a, could be a good plan. Now before I get going on the talk, I want to give you an authentic, unfiltered experience of nature. And of course, to do that, the first step, of course, is turn off the computer, okay? So uh, second step is to turn off all the lights. Okay, so could we turn off the lights, please? And uh, the third step is to turn on projector number one, Anand. So Anand is going to turn on, ah, there's projector number one, okay. So no virtual reality. No computer at all here. What you've got is some white hot piece of metal in the light bulb there. It's going through a piece of colored plastic and bouncing off the screen and into your eyes and that's a direct unfiltered experience of nature, okay? On the other hand, it's not such an exciting experience. Um, let's go with projector number two also, Anand. Okay, um, it's a vivid experience, right? It's a vivid experience, but uh, so far nothing particularly interesting. But Anand, I wonder if you could just twist projector number two so it lands on projector number one and now you see something that uh, might be a little bit surprising. Might cause you a little bit of alarm, especially the more you think about it. Um, what you've got here, I had those two colors, and Anand, he didn't pop out the slide and stick in another slide. He just turned those two projectors. You can see, see the red and the green around the edges, but down in the middle you get something, and I think not one of us would call that color reddish green. And not one of us would call that color greenish red. That's some new color, okay? Your reptile brain is insisting to you that that's some new fundamental experience, nothing mixed, it's a color we call yellow, even though your intellect knows that you just saw me achieve it by mixing. So there's some cognitive dissonance there, and I'm sorry, gentlemen in the audience, uh, one out of 25 of you are not gonna see the same thing that the rest of us are seeing. I'm just gonna have to make that up to you later, but um, most of us are seeing something that doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't fit, okay? Uh, all right. And what comes next? Um, you know, I wonder if you could turn off uh, the red slide, Anand, and pop out the green slide. And now you've got a piece of light. That's another sensation, the sensation we're very familiar with. We usually call that white, okay? And uh, most people would say that there's no color there at all. But there, I've got this hunk of glass in my hand. And if I take that hunk of glass and intercept that light, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, there come these beautiful saturated colors that didn't seem to be there before, but uh, there they are right now. Now, uh, you probably know the answer to that puzzle, but in the 17th century, people were totally baffled by this thing, and there was hot argument. There are people going along saying, well, of course, that light was colorless, and so the glass must have added the color to it. It stains the light, that's the phrase that people used to say. And uh, Isaac Newton found that he couldn't really, he couldn't really agree with that. And, uh, he did an experiment. So if I turn off projector number two on end and get number one back on again, Isaac Newton said, well, you know, if this piece of glass is adding color to the light, then I should be able to take a color that comes from that spectrum, some pure color, and stick that chunk of glass in it and uh, generate that rainbow all over again. But you can't, okay? Uh, there it is. Uh, you take that red light, you try to generate that rainbow, and all you get is red, maybe a little yellow stuck in there as well. Okay, uh, Newton says the only way I can interpret this is by saying that that stuff that looked like a pure singular sensation, that white light, is really a mixture. And this chunk of glass is simply separating out that mixture. If I send you something pure that's just from one band of that, then it, you can't split it anymore, it's already pure. And that's what's going on in that experiment. Um, Anand, I wonder if you could give me uh, the second projector with the green slide back in it again. So, um, 
When I made that spectrum for you from the white light, there was one band in it that looked like yellow. And there's this thing that looked like yellow, but there's a difference. That spectral yellow, if I put this thing through it, I can't split it anymore. It stays yellow, just like the red and the green. But if I take this kind of yellow and I stick it through the prism, oh, look, I was able to split it right back up again into red and green. You might have thought, oh, well, there's some chemical reaction between the red light and the green light, and they fuse and they turn into some new category of object, and that's what comes into your eyes and looks like yellow. Uh-uh. No, no, no. What's coming in, into your eyes is red plus green, and I can split them apart. So here's what's so upsetting about that experiment. There's two different kinds of yellow, and they look the same to you, but physically they're different. There's the one in the spectrum that cannot be split, and there's this one that can be split. They're different, but you can't tell the difference. So what's the problem with that? Well, you know, all your life you've been told about how perfect your body is and how perfect your eyes are, and either evolution or some intelligent designer has made your eyes so perfect. How could they be so bad they can't even tell the difference between those two physically different kinds of light? Um, let me try something else on you. I'll get my computer back. I've added a third splotch of light up here. And there's uh, the blue plus the red, and that's magenta. There's the red plus the green, that's yellow. There's a little cyan over here. And when you add all three of them together, there's that white again. But it's not the same white as before. It's red plus green plus blue. If I send that through a, spec through a prism, I'll get three blotches of color. You know, here's what you get from the sun. You send that through a prism, and you get those, that broad spectrum of light that we enjoy looking at. Most of us, how unfortunately, spend our time under fluorescent lights, and we get something like this, which is what I showed you a minute ago. Some red, some green, some blue, big dark spots in between them, and your eyes are so crappy that they can't tell the difference between those two kinds of light. Doesn't seem right. Something doesn't fit. I think I'm all done with the projectors on that. Thanks. And we can get a little light back, too. So maybe you're saying to yourself, oh, come on, why is he insulting my intelligence with this baby demonstration? I came here to hear about the cosmic mysteries, and all he's showing me is this thing that I always saw in middle school. Well, sorry if you feel that way. Uh, I'm going to stop right now and begin to talk. But first, let me ask, are you sure you really saw it in school? And when I was in school, I just heard people standing around claiming it was true. Nobody actually gave me the experience like I just gave to you. And uh, I have to admit, I never bothered to give it to myself until too many years had gone by. Or I read it in books, and they're claiming things too. OK, there's a point coming up. As a nation, we're sort of, turning, we're sort of losing the distinction between reality and virtual reality. And uh, we're turning into this big Pixar nation. Because virtual reality, it's so smooth, it's so seductive, it's so superior to real reality in certain ways that uh, you lose track of that. But really, you know, virtual reality, I could have shown that to you on the computer screen, but basically it's no different from me just standing here making bald-faced claims at you. Okay? You've got to trust the guy who's saying that to not be making a mistake, to not be trying to fool you, and to actually know what's going on and things like that. And, uh, you know, there's a problem with experts. You've got to trust me to be an expert. The problem with experts, you know, I like something Richard Feynman said, you've got to learn from science that you have to doubt experts. In fact, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. That's what Richard Feynman told us. So all right, you saw something with your own eyes, you make up your own mind, okay? Maybe I'll guide you a little bit, but at least we're standing on something firm. And anyway, it's fun, and fun is good. I only have two topics tonight. This is the beginning of the talk, by the way. Um, first thing is, what is color and how do we see it? And there's a subtext behind that one. Uh, if you know what the answer to that question, then maybe you could make a gadget that discriminates color better than humans. It might be good for something. Second point is, what sets the ultimate limit to our visual sensitivity? And are we anywhere close to that limit? And of course, there's a subtext to that one too. If you, make a, if you understand that, you might be able to make a gadget that could use that insight to do something useful. So to tell you those two topics, I'm gonna have just four big ideas. And by the way, that's the, that's the progress bar up there, so you won't have to keep looking at your watch. Okay. <laughs> Point number one, understanding your own body sometimes requires the coolest and the neatest and the newest physics ideas. I like that. Sometimes a simple physical measurement can give you some insight into how things work way, way sooner than ought to have been possible. I'm going to tell you a little story about that. 
But sometimes that measurement has to be connected with some mathematical analysis. Oh no, oh my god, math, it's the M word. Put yourself in my hands, okay? Uh, it's only going to be for an hour, how bad could it be? And uh, I think you'll get the point. Once you understand even partly how nature has done even one of these cool tricks that nature knows how to do, then you gain practical benefits sometimes. Now, you know, we're supposed to be thinking about truth and beauty too, and I gotta say, I also like the fact that it's also beautiful. Maybe you'll agree with me and maybe you won't. So, I wanna tell you a little secret. A little self-revelation, something I've never told anyone in my whole life. Do you believe it? Are you ready? Okay, when I was a kid, I had this fantasy. Wait for it. I imagined that I was this high-tech Cold War spy. Oh, great, give me a break, you know, you're saying to yourself, doesn't he know that two out of three little boys had that exact same fantasy? Yeah, well, I know that, but um, why do you think I never told anybody? Okay, but unlike them, I sort of grew up to do that. I mean, I sort of grew up. And uh, there's a point I wanna make here, that's why I'm giving you this painful self-revelation. There's an analogy between scientific research and espionage that I wanna draw on. You know, we've got these complex distant adversaries like cancer or climate change or something like that. We had all these agents out in the field that are just trying to find something useful to do about that. There's a far-flung network of these agents and some of us, our mission is obviously relevant. You know, infiltrate that factory and see what they're making. That's called applied research. Others of us are uh, sitting there looking at the big picture, trying to understand what's going on in the world, looking for things that don't fit things that don't fit. Sometimes you can mine that into some nugget, could be useful for somebody. You know, just like real spies, we're often not as glamorous as the fictional ones, although I can't help pointing out, guys, look, 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 look at that receding hairline, huh, huh? I'm just saying, all right? <laughs> I don't know, just saying. But uh, sometimes you spend a lot of effort and you wind up getting something that you have to admit didn't do anybody any good. Sometimes the work's kind of mundane, sometimes it's lonely, okay? But once in a while you get that nugget. Maybe it's not a nugget that has anything to do with what you thought you were going to discover, but some master spy can figure out where it fits and get something good out of it. That's my metaphor for science. Oh yes, and sometimes there really is a high-tech gizmo that even James Bond himself would have been proud to employ. Maybe it's a gizmo that was invented for some completely different purpose, but a good spy, has this lateral thinking thing where you say, oh yeah, I need that nugget of information, maybe this gizmo would do it. I can give you an old fashioned example. You know, some guy sticks two lenses together, makes a telescope, he says, ah, I can put it on the horizon, see ships coming in, gain a commercial advantage by being the first person who sees the ships coming in. Like three months later, Galileo gets a hold of one of these things, looks up at the sky and says, hmm, hmm, I see some stuff going around, something that's not the sun, revolution in science, okay? That's the kind of spycraft that I have in mind, that's not the story I wanna tell you tonight, it's like the story I want to tell you tonight. 